I feel like I am standing on holy ground this morning. We're going to talk about a subject around which all other truths cluster. And uh, sometimes it's necessary to become very specific about that. Sometimes we talk about it in a very general way and it doesn't really come through like it should. I want to read a little passage, just a short couple of sentences from the little book, Selected Messages, Volume 1, page 359 and 360. And here's what it says. <clears throat> the present message of justification by faith is a message from God. This was written about 1888, about the 1888 message that came to this church. It bears the divine credentials for its fruit is unto holiness. Holiness is about sanctification, right? The fruit of this great truth is holiness. And then um, on the next page, it says, there is not one in 100 who understands for himself the Bible truth on this subject that is so necessary to our, our present and eternal welfare. That's what I want to talk about. By the, by the way, this little book, Selected Messages, Volume 1, is all about that. It majors on that. This is the one book that talks about that in its entirety. It's a wonderful book to, to contemplate and to look at. Uh, I don't know what you think about when you hear the expression, by faith alone. I don't know what goes through your mind. I used to be uncomfortable with the idea. Do you know when we start out, we start out at Mount Sinai usually, right? We're telling everybody about the Sabbath, right? And we end up at Calvary. From Sinai to Calvary. And when we get to Calvary, I tell you that everything is swallowed up in one truth, and that's Jesus Christ. I used to be uncomfortable with the idea that salvation is by faith alone. I'd like to read, have us read together a text from Romans chapter 3, verse 28. Romans chapter 3, verse 28. When you have it, say amen. It says, therefore, and it's when we see a therefore, we need to ask ourselves, what is it there for, right? Therefore, he's been talking about this the whole chapter. Therefore, we conclude that a man is justified by faith without the deeds of the law. What a clear statement. What a pristine statement that is. That salvation is by faith alone. Sola fide. That's what the reformers call it. By faith alone. By faith alone or only by faith, literally. Sola only. It was the battle cry of the Reformation. It was radical in Paul's day. He got Paul into trouble. They thought he was doing away with the law when he said, when he said that justification is by faith without the works of the law. In fact, it probably led him to, give the, to, talk, to write the last verse of that same chapter, chapter 3, verse 31. Do we then make void the law through faith? Yea, we establish the law, right? And uh, finally, he uh, met martyrdom. He had a trial. Uh, if you turn to back a few pages to the book of Acts, Acts chapter uh, 24, verse 14, this is what he said at his trial. This is why he was shipped off to Rome. The Jews would have nothing of his, of his uh, justification by faith or by faith alone idea. Here's what it says, uh, 24, verse 14. He says at his trial, but this I confess unto thee, that after the way which they call heresy, so worship I the God of my fathers, believing all things that are written in the law and in the prophets. Very plain words. Don't do away with the law. I know in 1888, when this message first came to our people, there were some who said, well, we're going to do away with our message. We, we're, we're preaching the law, right? And somebody else said, we're preaching the law until we're dry as the hills of Gilboa, which had neither dew nor rain. 
It is this truth that causes us to want to keep the law or to love the law of God. You know, David, that, uh, that big sinner, David, and he knew it. In Psalm 51, he makes this great confession. And what a confession it is. And as a result of his conversion, he said, oh, how I love thy law. But he knew what forgiveness was, and that's what justification is. Oh, how I love thy law. It is my meditation all the day. So it was radical in Paul's day. It was radical in Luther's day. Luther almost lost his life over this great truth. Uh, he was delivered miraculously from a, from a council that was bent to put him on the on the tree. It, was rad it is radical now. Most of Christianity will not, will argue against the, this pure article. I'm going to say that again. Most Christians will, artic will argue against this pure article of justification by faith alone. Most will. I've been in some Bible studies with people of other persuasions and they say, but we've got to do something, right? Don't we have to do something? And uh, that's the battle cry. But more I study the Bible and the spirit of prophecy, I've come to love the Bible message of justification by faith. Alone, plus nothing. Are we allowed to say that here? Amen. Yes. It's the truest, in its truest biblical context, it's not quietism. Quietism uh, would sit and look up into the sky and say, let go and let God. Their message was just, let Christ live out his victorious life within me. They thought that was the gospel. That was quietism. This is not quietism that we're talking about this morning. Quietism is not the righteousness of faith in Paul or Luther or Ellen G. White. I'll have to admit there is a slight element of truth in that idea that I just mentioned. But righteousness by faith does not mean slothful, slothful indolence or nothingness either. The reformers of the 15th, 15th and 16th century, they were dynamic, dynamic. They had a dynamic message. It was a movement of blood and fire. And many were, were burned to the stake because of this idea. The reformers were willing, were willing martyrs in order to honor, honor God willing to do anything to further the cause of truth. They had three other uh, solas in their, in their confession. First one, sola fide, right? Only by faith. Then they had others, sola Christo, only by what? Only by Jesus, only by him. Sola Scriptura, what does that mean? The Bible only, the Bible and the Bible. They walked out of Rome with an open Bible in their hands. They put the pulpit in the center of the church and they preached the word of God. Like it was never preached since apostolic times. The other one is sola gratia. What, uh, what does that mean? By grace alone, only through grace. So what does faith alone mean? Sola fide. Our confession that all which was necessary for our acceptance with God has been done by God himself in the redeeming act of Jesus Christ. It is an acknowledgement that the, that the, uh, That Christ, it is an, our acknowledgement that Christ meritoriously met all of our obligations to God's law. That he paid all the bills. And justification simply means being judged righteous before the holy law. I'm glad for that this morning. All our debts are paid before the bar of eternal justice. In other words... Christ's work is complete, so perfect that you cannot add anything to it that's meaningful. Yeah. We need to believe that, though, Pastor. You got to believe it. It's by faith, right? Yes. By faith. Justification by faith. 
<laughs> Do you know Christianity is the only faith religion in the whole wide world? There are a lot of there's a lot of legalistic ideas out there all all around all the religions and and uh, you know the Eastern religions and so forth. All of it is about a ladder climbing to a higher higher precipice, a higher place of acceptance. I'd like to have us read uh, Colossians 2, verses 9 and 10. It was part of our scripture reading this morning. Colossians chapter 2, verses 9 and 10. It's a little book near the end of the Bible, just before Thessalonians. Colossians 2, verses 9 and 10. It says, For in him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. Who's that? Jesus, Jesus right? Godhead. One of three times the word Godhead is used in the New Testament. Verse 10, and you are complete where? In him. in him. In him. The Bible is so clear. In him, which is the head of all principality and power. And 1 Corinthians 1, 30 and 31. Back to the left, a few pages. 1 Corinthians 1. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 30 and 31. It says, but of him are you in Christ Jesus, who, is, who of God is made unto us wisdom and righteousness and sanctification and redemption, that according as it is written, he that glories, let him glory where? In the Lord. Let him glory in the Lord. Solified, he means that we cannot in the least way contribute to our salvation, but that we must submit and surrender to what God has already done that will, if we understand, humble the glory of man in the dust. There's no room for pride here, lest any man boast, right? That's the meaning of by faith alone. By faith alone does not mean that faith itself will make us pleasing and acceptable to God. Our faith has no virtue within itself. It's not a work. Faith is not a work, but faith is that which which has benefit only as it lays hold on the merit of Christ's righteousness. That's the only virtue in faith. Faith always has an object, right? Everything that uh, we put our trust in has an object, but it's the thing we put our trust in, right? So. In other words, faith is not a work, but rather the evidence of things not seen. And it will allow the Holy Spirit to fill our hearts with faith. There will be so much evidence in the scriptures that mountains could be moved. Jesus said that. Even mountains could be moved. It caused Noah to build an ark and preach the righteousness of God for 120 years to a people who didn't want to hear it. It caused Abraham to move to a country that was altogether strange to him with all the perils that were met there. These men of faith were filled with evidence and they hoped and they were filled with hope and they could do no other. That's what faith does. Faith works, right? Does faith work? By faith alone is also a confession that God's saving work has been completely done outside of our experience. I want to say that again. By faith alone is also a confession that God's saving work has been done completely outside of our own experience. There are some who will admit that God alone saves, but they imagine that the saving work is done inside of them and their merit is in their performance. Now that's heresy, I have to tell you that. Martin Luther, he would tell, tear his hair out if he heard somebody talking about talking like that. And so would the Apostle Paul. The real merit was done outside the gate of Jerusalem on a dark day on a Roman cross. Faith is always directed to this something that's outside of me. It's about the action of God in Jesus Christ. John Bunyan, the author of that uh, work, Pilgrim's Progress. How many of you read Pilgrim's Progress? If you haven't read it, get a copy of that. You can buy it at most every bookstore. John Bunyan, here's what he said. 
It is the righteousness which resides with a person in heaven, which justifies me, a sinner on earth. The book of Revelation shows the ongoing cause of Christ in the throne room of the universe. He alone can move history toward the great consummation. And finally, he alone can and must bring salvation to those who eagerly wait his coming. Hebrews 9.28. This is a favorite. Hebrews 9 verse 28. Let's take a little look at it. Hebrews is to the right from where we were. Hebrews 9 verse 27. For it is, and as it is appointed to men once to die, but after this, the judgment. So Christ was once offered to bear the sins of many, and to them that look for him will he, shall, will he appear the second time without sin unto salvation. You know, he's not coming here to deal with sin when he comes a second time. It's already been taken care of. And it's been taken care of primarily in the person of one one, one person, it's a man who he was seated beside, beside the throne of the uh, beside the Father in the throne of the universe. One of us. He was born to us. Uh, way ahead of my notes. He alone can move history toward the great consummation. Our looking should be directed to Jesus, His merit. And his work. Faith alone is therefore a confession that salvation is won by the mighty conquering acts in which we had no share. Mighty conquering, uh, conquering acts in which we had no share. Much the same way as creation. It was done without the aid of Adam and Eve or any one of us, right? It was something that took place outside of us, like salvation. Indeed. Creation is a type of salvation. Adam and Eve were asked to rest in a completed work on that first Sabbath day. What an idea. By faith alone is a confession that our righteousness is not in us, but in Jesus Christ. Where is your righteousness this morning? It's in the person of another. Maybe we could read a couple of texts about that. Colossians chapter 3, verses 3 and 4. Colossians chapter 3, verses 3 and 4. These are verses that some of us might want to memorize even. Colossians chapter 3, verses 3 and 4. We were just there a little while ago. It's uh, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians. Colossians 3, verses 3 and 4. Here's what it says. When Christ, who is our life, who is our life? Where's your life this morning? Do you have immortality? No. When Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then shall you also appear with him in glory. Verse 3 says, for you are dead, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. Our life isn't even within us. And uh, we might read another one. It's Jeremiah 33, 16. Back a few pages. Jeremiah 33, verse 16. This is a very plain one, very down-to-earth one. Verse 16 says, In those days shall Judah be saved, and Jerusalem shall dwell safely. And this is the name wherewith she shall be called the Lord, our righteousness. Whose righteousness? Where is your righteousness? The Lord is our righteousness. Okay. It's all in Christ. These two texts tell us together that righteousness equals life. And life equals righteousness. Real life. One who died. How many of you are dead this morning? <laughs> one who has died is not, to, is not apt to run ahead and usurp the glory that belongs only to Jesus. I am crucified with Christ. Pardon me? We should be dead to sin. Dead to sin, exactly. Alive to Christ. 
I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ who lives within me. Now, that's a, talk, that's a text about sanctification, by the way. This is the fruit. This is the evidence that we have been with Jesus, that we believe what he said. By faith alone means that we continually confess that we are sinners and have no righteousness to justify us except that which is outside of us in the person of our mediator, Jesus Christ. Amen. This is the chief fundamental difference between Christianity and the New Age movement. And the, we're living in the post-Christian era. Nobody believes this anymore. They didn't want to hear about the name of Jesus. The post-Christian era. The Christian abandons who abandons, I'm sorry, I can't even read my writing. <laughs> Does anybody here have that problem? <laughs> this is the age in which we were called to witness for God, when nobody's believing. Our best de deeds, when tried before undimmed splendor of God's law, are no better than filthy rags. Do you know who said that? The holy prophet Isaiah said that. All of our righteousnesses are as filthy rags. We are no closer to the nearest star when we're standing on Mount Whitney than when we are on the, in Death Valley floor, which you can be which are fairly close together. I think they're only about 100 miles apart or less. We're no closer to the nearest star when we're standing on the top of Mount Whitney than we are in the valley floor of Death Valley. We are never made more righteous before God by virtue of being born again or filled with the Spirit or obedience. These are things that happen within us, right? This is the work that somebody else does for us. Not something we conjure up. All these things have a purpose, but acceptance and salvation are not that purpose. Those are the fruits. The evidence that will be used in the judgment. God is looking for the fruit, the precious fruit. But that's not the basis of our salvation. It's not the cause of our salvation. It's not the beginning of our salvation. But the doing and suffering of Christ is. It's meritorious. Faith alone says, now you are complete. Where? In him. In him. That's a faith idea. By faith alone means true self-surrender and true crucifixion of self. It humbles the glory of man in the dust. When we say faith is only in Christ and his merit, we acknowledge self-destitution. We confess that we have nothing to pay with, like the man with the big debt in Jesus' parable of the debtors. Angie, we talked about that a little bit last night. Nothing to pay with. Faith alone means that we come to God relying on love, mercy, forgiveness, unfathomable. Faith alone leads us to depend on one who is powerful and all righteous. Nothing empties a person like by faith alone. That's what empties us all. Interesting text in Galatians chapter 3, verse 14. We were last in Jeremiah, so it's way off to the right. Near the end of the book, Galatians, just a little while before Hebrews and Thessalonians. Galatians 3, verse 14. Abraham is the great father of faith, right? Father of faithful. Here he says, verse 14, that the blessing of Abraham might come on the Gentiles through Jesus Christ, that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. So what brings the Spirit? <laughs> Good works? No, never. Faith in Jesus brings the Spirit. We uh, were pointed to him by the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit brings us faith, plants that faith in our hearts. The Holy Spirit can only fill a person who lives by faith. Otherwise, there will be a secret area within ourselves that is reserved for us. We don't want that to happen to us. We don't need any secret area, any more secret areas within us that, that uh, are reserved for self. Faith alone empties self 
and puts all of our trust in the doing and suffering of one other, and that's Jesus Christ. We should never speak faith plus something. It's not faith plus something. We should never speak that way. We're talking about our salvation here. Faith alone acknowledges us that we are dead and that Christ lives for our justification. Fifthly, faith alone is the fountainhead of all true obedience. Do you want to be obedient children? How many of you want to be obedient children? Yeah, that's the goal. That's the evidence that we've been with Jesus. And just faith alone is the fountainhead of all true obedience. Confidence in the true God. It's like a mainspring. Theo, <laughs> I don't know much about watches or clocks, but I used to take a clock apart, much to my mother's distress. <laughs> an alarm clock. We need that in the morning. Here, and I saw that mainspring. And what does that mainspring in a watch do or a clock? It runs all the little sprockets, right? Justification is like the mainspring of a watch. Everything, all the little sprockets turn because of the mainspring. The first commandment says, thou shalt have no other gods before me. Luther comments on that first commandment. I want to, I want to read to you what Luther had to say about the, thou shalt have no other gods before me. A God is that to which we look for all good and where we resort for help in every time of need. To have a God is simply to trust and believe in one with a whole heart. If your faith and confidence are right, then likewise your God is the true God. On the other hand, if, you, if your confidence is false, it is, if it is wrong, then you have not the true God. I say, whatever you, your heart confides in, that is really your God. If the heart is rightly disposed toward God, this commandment is kept. Obedience to the remainder of the law will follow of itself. No other gods. Uh, there's no reason for us to boast about anything. We only have one God. And uh, he's our Father in heaven. By faith alone frees a man for a life of good works. On the other hand, when a man fails to understand the gospel, he labors in vain and spends his strength for nothing. Trying harder doesn't do it in this case. I've been there, trying it hard, trying harder, trying to overcome a habit or some other thing that besets me. Freedom to serve when I don't have to worry about myself. Deep down in every soul, there's a consciousness of the need to be right with God. But justification is a great work which only God can do. Do you know we need justification as, as much at the beginning of the Christian pathway as we do at the end? Yes. Yes. No matter how high we have climbed the ladder of sanctification, we need justification and forgiveness as much at the end as we did at the beginning. Freedom to serve. That's what it does. It frees up within us the, uh, a freedom to serve. God said, I'm going to deliver them from Egypt. You find this in Exodus chapter 5. So they can go out in the desert and what do what? Serve me. Where did the horsepower for that come from? Only came from God. Zacharias and Elizabeth there. He talks about Jesus as being the one who frees us up to serve. If you're worried about your degree of sanctification, turn your heart to Jesus and he will supply the horsepower to bring a life that you can enjoy and that you can share with others. Justification is the source of all true meekness, meekness. These justified ones are the ones who inherit the new earth. Blessed are the meek, for they shall do what? Inherit the earth. Don't have to go around defending myself all the time. That's a, that's a really relief to me. I used to do that. When a person is released from anxiety for himself, he 
is for you to exercise concern for other people, right? Only justified believers will go out and tell about Jesus. The rest of them is too hard. The shoe leather wears out too fast. Faith alone does not mean that Christ has done it all. There's nothing for me to do. That doesn't mean that at all. But it means that there's no merit in what I do. It, it, it points us to a life of sanctification, but that's not the merit. Faith alone, because of acceptance, puts a person to work for God as nothing else can do. It's a stimulant to stir up into action. A heart of gratitude becomes the fruit which spawns obedience. All true obedience is spawned by the, by the grace of gratitude which comes from the Holy Spirit. A life of sanctification is not possible unless we are persuaded that we are acceptable and pleasing to God. Are we accepted, acceptable and pleasing to God if we've given our hearts to Jesus? He looks at us as though we had never ever sinned. And only a person who has that, who has that consciousness is free to serve him. Everybody else is trying to work his way some way or another. This per persuasion can not be grounded on our past life, our present life. In my past life, there's nothing much to be proud of. What about my present? Not much there either. The great apostle Paul, notice his, his meekness and humility. It's uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 16. 1 Corinthians 9, verse 16. I'm going to be done here in about 10 minutes. Somebody told me I could preach until quarter after. 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 16. Notice Paul. For though I preach the gospel... Nobody preached the gospel like the Apostle Paul did. <laughs> he went all over the world. One time they, they tried to stone him outside of a city, and he laid there like a dead man. And when they heard, didn't hear any voices anymore, he picked himself up, dusts off his, cl his clothing, and goes to the next town and preaches the gospel again. Nobody preached the gospel like Apostle Paul. For though I preach the gospel, I have nothing to glory of. For necessity is laid upon me. Yea, woe, to, if, woe is to me. If I preach not the gospel, he was constrained to preach the gospel by the Holy Spirit. But he takes no, takes no glory for himself. God wants us to be settled on the idea that he's perfectly satisfied with his son. Do you think the father is, is perfectly satisfied with his son? I read somebody someplace where we do not need to worry about what the father thinks about us, but what he thinks about Christ, my substitute. That's the important idea, right? <laughs> he wants us, he wants, he, he wants us to be also. That is why he is our representative. Our high priest in heaven is our representative before the Father, before all the holy angels. He bears our humanity in the presence of God. And if we try to live a Christian life, either to secure or consolidate our acceptance with God, immediately what happens? The well springs, springs of free, grateful, spontaneous obedience will be dried up. We don't want that to happen. We want rivers of living water to flow from us, right? Because of our gratitude to what Jesus has done for us. We begin to work in the vineyard and our obedience is like the, el like the elder son in the parable of the, of the prodigal son. Obedience, to be sure. Do you think that elder son was obedient? Yeah, he was out there working all the time. God is more interested in why we obey than in what we do. From a thankful, grateful heart, he wants, he wants rivers of love, living waters to flow from us. The elder son kept a record of years of faithful service and was really in the pig pen more than the prodigal son was. You know, we call this the parable of the prodigal son. I think it, it really ought to be uh, the parable called the parable of the loving father, the author of all the good news. 
parable of the loving father. We don't, we don't talk about it. We kind of glorify what, the, what that prodigal son did, right? But God is the one to whom all of our, from whom all of our blessings flow. Faith alone, like John the Baptist, points away from itself. It says, he must increase, but I must what? Decrease. It points away from itself from the Lord God who takes away the sins of the world. John says, fear God and give glory to him. Fear him, love him, trust him, obey him, live for him, witness for him, fear him, respect him, and give all the glory to who? To Jesus. Give glory to him. That's how we do that, right? Take no glory to ourselves. There's no room for us to boast about anything. That's the only safe way to enter the judgment. To enter the judgment with anything less is to suffer eternal disappointment. You know, this is why we're saved by grace through faith alone. But we're judged by our works. How come? The works are the evidence that we've been with Jesus. If there's no evidence, then what happens? The judge throws it out. What else can he do? He's not going to take a bunch of rebels to heaven, is he? Can't do that. There was a problem there once before. Faith alone lets God be the God of salvation, allows man to be the recipient of all those benefits. Remember the saying of Jesus? That he who is forgiven much, that means justified. He who is forgiven much, loves much. Luke 7. That's what drives the sanctified life. If your works are good, it's because they are driven by gratitude for the forgiveness, the justification that comes only through Jesus Christ. The one who really hears the word of justification, neither do I condemn thee. That's the word of justification. Now go and sin no more. That we need to take that seriously, don't we? Yes, take it all seriously. He's the one who is really qualified to obey the command, go and sin no more. The one who is for fully forgiven is the only one who's qualified to go and sin no more. The strongest inducement for Christians to obey is the fact that he has been graciously pardoned. He follows after the sanctified life, follows after the spirit, as it says in Galatians 5, because he's a justified believer. Not in order to become one, not in order to have favor with God. He don't obey for that reason. He obeys because he is a justified believer. Our last text, 2 Corinthians 7, verse 1. 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 1. It's a great chapter about repentance. Second Corinthians chapter seven, verse one. Having therefore these promises, therefore again, therefore. What's it there for? Think about the promises. That's where faith is born, right? We study the word of God so that faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. That's where the promises are. That's where we develop trust and faith. So 7 verse 1 says, having therefore these promises, dearly beloved. Promises? What is the great promise? The greatest of all. The great truth around which all other truths cluster. What is it? Justification by faith. Fullness, fullness of forgiveness. That's the promise. Dearly beloved. Ha let me start again. Having therefore these promises, dearly beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. Holiness comes as a result of taking God at his word and having faith in those promises that we are free now to serve, free to serve. Delivered from Egyptian bondage that they can go out in the desert and serve me. Freed from bondage through justification, forgiven fully so that I can serve him. That is the relationship between justification and sanctification. 
It comes from a grateful heart. It's not in order that I can be saved, but it's because of what Jesus did. Yes, it's a bilateral covenant, but someone who was perfect in love has to stand in my place in the covenant and fulfill my end of the deal. A covenant is between two people at least, right? Anybody here kept the covenant perfectly? You know, the judgment is gonna require perfect perfection. We only have that in one person, and that's in Jesus. To stand in my place and to yield that which the law requires. I'm saved and accepted in him. My heart rejoices in that. They overcame him by the blood of the lamb and the word of their testimony. Tell everybody about it. This is a message that needs to be, it's, it's, it is something that, that uh, you know, the world still, still waits to hear. Let's pray. Dear Father in heaven, I wanna thank you again for sharing your life with us, for sharing your righteousness with us, something we cannot do our, on our own. Lord, help us to go forth in this place with meekness and humility that you have done this for us and that we can't add to it by anything we do. And then Lord, fill us with your spirit as we go forth from this place. Use us to proclaim this message to other people. I pray that you'll be with everyone here according to their need this morning. I'm so thankful that Wayne has gone home from the hospital. Lord, please continue to make him whole. And all of us, Lord, keep us as we move into this new and uncertain week. Keep us in the hollow of your hand as only you can do. And I pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.